Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever time of day you're listening to it. Thank you for tuning in to There's No Business Like. And this week, I am joined with the fanciest of friends, Danielle. Hey, everybody. It's Danielle Van Hook from the Alden and McLean, Virginia. Brian. How you doing, young man? I'm Brian Zelmer from KU Presents in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Katie. I cannot take you seriously right now. Um, <laughs> hi, Kevin. This is Katie from the Midland Center for the Arts in Midland, Michigan. And Josh. Josh Benson, rocking it from Marion, Illinois. And this voice you're hearing right now is Kevin Maynard from Quad City Arts, <laughs> splitting the border between <laughs> Iowa and Illinois. <laughs> Well, that was fun. Thanks for indulging me there. <laughs> so this week I sat down with Juan Vang from Springboard for the Arts. Uh, but outside of that, Juan is also a cross-stitch artist. So I was wondering, what phrase would you cross-stitch onto something that you identify with? Mine would be pain is just weakness leaving the body, but I would want a big like gash bleeding along the side of it. I don't know why, but I think every cross-stitch art that I've had or I've seen has been like located in a bathroom. And I, I don't know <laughs> why that's the case. Um, but so I like have this like association with like it being like one of the first things I see in the morning and like mm, probably eight out of 10 mornings. Like the first thing I think of when I get up is mm, everything hurts and I'm dying, <laughs> which is a Leslie <laughs> Note quote from Parks and Rec. <laughs> He has the flu. But when anybody, whenever anybody asks me how I'm feeling half of the time, I just want to be like, everything hurts and I'm dying. Danielle, I also would put a Leslie Nope quote on the cross stitch that says, one person's annoying is another person's inspiring and heroic. Because as a woman, a lot of people think my drive in ambition is annoying, but I think I'm setting a great example for other young women in my, in my world. I do too. If I hang it up in my office, mine is, it can wait till tomorrow. Ooh, that's a good one. I think mine would just say, this is fine. With the dog on With fire. With the dog in the house burning down. <laughs> or just the, yeah, that that or just a dumpster fire. Either one. Well, thanks, friends. Uh, now, please enjoy this conversation with Juan Vang. My name is Juan Vang. I work at Springboard for the Arts, and my current title is Economic Opportunity Director. Juan, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate you having this conversation with me. Obviously, one of the things I want to talk to you about is the things that you're doing with Springboard. But before we dive into your role there, I thought it'd be great to talk a little bit about you. Can you tell me a little bit about the path that brought you to where you are today? Yeah, I'm a what you call full-time part-time artist. <laughs> It started out as a hobby. So my younger sister and I have a run a business called Third Daughter, Restless Daughter. And we do funny pop culture, snarky cross stitches. Um, if you think of it, we've done it. <laughs> uh, we've been doing it for seven years now. And it's it was she had originally had started it as a way to like do like inexpensive presents for friends. Mm. And then she got really busy. So then I jumped in and I ended up uh, managing a lot more of our our relationships, our partnership with people and events and stuff. So, and more the business side. And then now we've grown in the past seven years, we've grown to do like larger installations. So we, we have a couple installations like at um, a restaurant. Um, oh, actually now it's, it's a, there's three restaurants of the same restaurant. So we've done it for all three restaurants now and they're like huge. They're like eight feet by 10 feet. Wow. Um, also at the M um, and then springboard um, and springboard for the arts um, has actually has us had us commission a piece before I started there. So, and that's kind of how that path and that connection that I had with springboard that led me to, to working with them. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so cool. So uh, I've, I've seen your work and I think I, I told you, but like I first time I like clicked through your website, I was like, oh my gosh, it's like this brought me so much joy because it's it is like it's very fun, but it is like a little snarky and I just I, I absolutely loved it. I was curious though, the, the name Third Daughter, Restless Daughter, where did that come from? It came after a, a song that she had um, called Second Daughter, Restless Daughter. Mm. So then she was like Third Daughter, Restless Daughter. So she is actually the third daughter. So when she started it, that's what she named it. When I jumped in, she's like, well, we could change the name. I'm like, no, I like the name. So so now I end up being the restless daughter. Even though, <laughs> so, so that's how it kind of like that name kind of started. And it just kind of stuck, you know, because then it, it worked well with like everything that we fell right in line with us um, being that we are both the middle child out of four. 
typical siblings, I should say that, who fights when they're when they're together, but yet we we mesh very well together. That is a very similar relationship that I have with both of my sisters. <laughs> sort of speaking on on, on your work as well. Um, so uh, at the bottom of your website on our homepage, you have this like tagline that says uh, because our lives are dope and we do dope shit. So I'm curious where that came from because I saw it and I was like, I love that. <laughs> I know. I it's funny because we have two quotes that that we have. So one quote that we actually started out with um, was the never give up on your stupid, stupid dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and that is like, that's how we like, we started. And, um, and also so, like, like what, what a great mantra that is. Yes, like, just, yes. <laughs> Eventually, like the dope life one, it, it was a Dave Chappelle one that he was talking about Kanye West. Mm. Gotcha. <laughs> and so so it just kind of for some reason, like stuck. Amazing. This this journey that we've actually come in with our cross stitching, starting out with just cross stitching and then growing into installations. And then recently in the last couple of years of growing and doing uh, more community events that would help, you know, better the, the individuals, the artists, the small businesses within our community to like our the little Asia market that we've been doing for the last two years. And that has been like amazing. We've seen the amazing support behind that and our turnout and our artists who or who are part of this event and then then the mission behind it too very cool kind of circling back a little bit you said your your sister started to start doing the cross stitching um is what what got her into cross stitching originally like was that just something she saw the art form was like oh i want to do this or was there i mean did, did you do it growing up in the Hmong traditional culture there's a tradition traditional cross stitching called bandao which means it's like flower cloth or story cloth mm. So, and as my grandmother had done it, it was a way for her to make something new for whether it's like decoration for like, you know, your New Year's outfit or adding mm. that element. And so my grandmother was doing it for years. She taught my, my mother and my mother was, both of them were, were great at what they did. Growing up, we, we learned it um, through my grandmother and my mother, just like, and I remember like sitting down and just, you sit on this like really low kind of, we call it a cutting, just sit on it. And you're like, you're stitching for hours and hours, and hours, because you want to be able to complete this outfit by the time of when New Year came. So that's kind of how like we learned it. We've been in the U.S. since I was five you know, so we had come from Laos is where I was born and then originally mm. then went to Thailand and then now um, live in the U.S. And having been that first generation immigrant, they having to Americanize everything. And mm. being that we knew some of the techniques, we we ended up doing like more Americanized, you know, like the cross stitching kits that yeah. you would buy from like Michaels and Joanne, Joanne Fabrics. And then and then life happened. <laughs> and then many <laughs> years passed. And then all. So when you all was doing it, she uh, like I said, she started it, it as a way to like make presents. Very cool. Getting back to, to Springboard for the Arts, you, you mentioned, like, well, I guess one of my questions was how you got there initially, but you you did an, an installation piece uh, with them, which is how you kind of connected with them originally. What led you to to where you're at with them now after that? The great thing is, like, you encouraged me to, my sister, you encouraged me to, like, pursue it. She's like, do it. She's like, you want to work with arts. You want to work for artists. It's something you've always wanted to do. So, and that's kind of how that you know, like my love and my passion for working with other artists, because I felt like when you are around other artists, when you can bring people together to be able to work together, there's so much good happens from that, you know? And so yeah. when I decided to and applied and applied for the position, it was like one of those things where, where I was like, I don't think I'm going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. So, uh, so, and that was a change in my life. And this only happened last September, but this was a change in my life where I was like, this is a good change. I'm glad I did this. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I have that same response. I think every job that I've ever applied for, I've gone, I'm not, I'm not, they're, they're not going to call. Why would they yeah. call? You know. <laughs> So your title there is Economic Opportunity Director. What exactly is that? Mm -hmm. I know. I've, it's, a, it's a big title. <laughs> <laughs> if you have this like formal description, it's like leading and implementing like Springboard's economic opportunity programs that like build relationships between artists and communities. So mm -hmm. basically, it's really leading programs that will help connect communities and artists, help them support them so they can in the end financially support themselves in a way. Mm. 
there's like several things that fall underneath my my umbrellas. I work with a, a team of two plus them. We have like, you know, the whole staff that we work mm-hmm. together. Some of the programs that fall underneath me is the Grow Fund, uh, where we funded artists, 16 artists, $2,500. It's hard because you don't think of artists as businesses. Because, you know, they're, they're one person most of the time, you know, maybe two at the most. You know, when you think about it, they are a micro business. And that is like one of the hard things. Yes, this is something that we talk about a lot that like, especially in our office at Quad City Arts, like we just explaining to people that artists are their own business. And even mm-hmm. artists have sometimes they don't think about it that way. They're like, oh, I'm just creating. And like, I sell a little bit of work. I'm like, yeah, but that's that's a business. Like mm-hmm. you have to. There's a lot that goes into that. Because <laughs> you make that exchange or the interaction with others. Either you're selling your talent, you're selling your work, or you're selling something. We have a resource lab, and then we provide like technical assistance programming mm-hmm. within our economic opportunity team. So this is includes like professional development. It means one-on-one consultations. We have a huge roster of fabulous, these wonderful like consultants. And if mm. you think of anything that you wanted to ask, probably have a consultant to um, cover that. So let's say wow. that you wanted something on like how to set up your business. We have a consultant that can walk you through some of these things and guide you. Marketing, accounting. We have lawyers that we work with that can help you with some pro bono work, whether it's like re- helping you read a contract, you know, and reviewing a contract or if you wrote a contract and just to make sure that it's, you know, it, if there's anything missing, they are specialized in that. Then we work with our community development team who does a lot more community events and getting out to the community and that interaction that happens too. I think that that's absolutely incredible. I mean, because one of the things, I mean, we talk about in this podcast a lot is just access to resources and what artists need and sometimes don't even realize that they need until they until they're out there doing it. So mm-hmm. this podcast particularly focuses primarily on performing arts and, and touring arts, um, which makes this interview a little bit of an outlier for us. I specifically wanted to talk to you because one of the things that we always start talking about and that kind of continually comes up is the conversation surrounding pay and pay equity. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about what you're running and what Springboard Ar- Springboard for the Arts is doing with their guaranteed income program. So can you talk a little bit about that, how the project started and, and why? Yeah. So a little bit of history of what the guaranteed income is. The program is a monthly payment of $500 to individuals. And um, it's unconditional. There's no strings attached, um, no work requirements. And then, but we also wanted to supplement um, artists' incomes and, and not replace like the social, the existing social safety net that they have. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, in the end, it could also be like a tool for racial and gender equity. Mm-hmm. It started back right in the midst of the pandemic. So Springboard did a little like fundraiser. So they, we got we got funds. So we were able to fund artists with this. So then in our head, we knew that artists were in need at that time. Mm-hmm. We were probably right at the forefront of the the the, the guaranteed income focus on artists because San Francisco had ran the first one. Mm-hmm. And then we were right around the like I, I want to say that we were right around we were at the beginning. So we were either like the second or third um, nonprofit organization or even organization that targeted just artists. Mm-hmm. Since that 2021, we have seen several other organizations who've used similar models of supporting artists through this guaranteed income. And it's been amazing to be able to say, hey, we were at the beginning of it. So we do get a lot of people who reach out and said, hey, Mm -hmm. how did you do this? What did you do? And then the great thing is we had like templates of like letters that we wrote out, our structure and stuff. So we were able to help support more, um, more programs like this nationwide. Wow. Very cool. So how is it funded? I mean, is this, I assume by, by, by different foundations or grants? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it's all private funding. Mm. It's not public funding that we, yeah. we, we receive, which is, which is amazing that we were able to get that support. Yeah. I mean, it, that's honestly truly incredible. So you said it, it's, it's unconditional. So, I mean, there, there's no like work component tied to that. I'm sure with the, the first round, you obviously have seen outcomes and, and know that there's been some positive outcomes from it because obviously you, you're running it again. I guess two questions, like one, what are some of those outcomes? And then two, how are you collecting those stories? We work with the researcher over at UPenn or U- hmm. University of Pennsylvania. So, and they are doing research on the whole overall like guaranteed income 
our lead researcher, her name's Dr. Kaylin Flynn, um, amazing person, the nicest person ever. She's doing all this research for, for us. So not wow. just us, but overall, like for their mm -hmm. program. But uh, we, we, we're working with her directly. She is in direct communication with the artists. Based off of the data that we receive, they were definitely using the money efforts towards things that we would expect, whether it's paying rent, handling some emergencies, food, the, the typical things. But yeah. the great thing is like over time, like as as they get more comfortable, because like when you get this like uh, offer like this, you're like, OK, well, I need to make sure that I use that money for certain things. And you don't think about like, OK, so is this money going to last or am I going to is it is it, a, is it too good to be true? And so over time, like it was great to be able to know that they're starting to um, use this, the funds towards things that better their career, that would better what they do. You know, so I, I would hear stories like I took classes. I'm a little bit more stable. So I was able to take that money and um, and use it towards like course that to develop my artistry. Mm. Very cool. This is sort of a a. a weighted question kind of curious like do you do you think that this is a viable program long term i don't know on a personal level what i would love to see is now that we've had some type of this program in place you know for at least our second round because mm -hmm. what we did was the first 25 artists that was in the program that's in the first phase was able to roll over for another mm -hmm. 18 months so they are, have 36 months total. Wow. So we wanted to kind of see like, hey, if we carry those first 25 artists ongoing, what can I do for them? And then on this phase two, we have 25 again in the Rondo Fractal neighborhood. So the same neighborhood. So 25 fresh new people. And then we also wanted to see how the Ottertail County, which is more of a rural area, like how did those the artists in that that community mm -hmm. how do they use their funds you know mm. like how does by supporting them with this five hundred dollars how does that su support them and that is um the ottertail county area that's one of the first or rural community of artists wow. so which is which is going to be really nice to see where that data is but ideally like i would love to see since we are piloting we're trying this like can this policy move forward outside mm -hmm. the springboard by just piloting and getting this data. Can we, is there, is there some type of policy movement that could happen? I'm fascinated by it because <laughs> I, I think that, I mean, obviously you, you're, you're going to see it firsthand and you are seeing it firsthand that there's going to be some incredible outcomes from it. And especially since you're able to roll over that first group to see what that long-term impact is. I I'm, I'm excited for you. Like, I think it's just going to be really great. And I think it, it really has a potential to make the case as to why something like that's important. Um, I mean, even even just in the arts, one of the things we talk about a lot is like just grant dollars and like grant dollars to organizations. And, you know, we obviously all advocate for like operating dollars because we believe that our organizations and our boards know how to best spend that money. And it's a very similar aspect when you do the same thing for artists or to individuals saying like, look, we you know where you need this money from. And just having that peace of mind gives them an opportunity to create from that space versus, you know, creating from a space of like, I have to make my rent, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is very different headspace. Yeah. There are definitely lots of successful ar artists oh, who yeah. can be full-time. There's so many out there who has to like determine, like, can I, can I, I got to work, but mm -hmm. I really, I have the space in, that I need to get my work out. You know, when I go into work, I'm like, I'm up to like, three o'clock in the morning like yeah I mean like I'm just like I work and then I like I get get home eat dinner you know and take care of my niece and my mom and you know <laughs> and then I then then I'm in the space where I'm gonna I'm gonna just work for the rest of the night on on my artistry yeah wow Obviously, I think like doing with with everything that you're doing with the guaranteed income program and your your just your role as Springboard. I'd like to talk a little bit about pay equity um, because it's something that that comes up from us. And I imagine your role uh, in in doing those things, you might have some information on this. And so, I, I mean, obviously, like we know that there is a a pay equity gap. I mean, just as far as like gender and race, and honestly, even from the top level employee to your your lowest level employee, like there's giant gaps there. There is, there is. I mean, like women get paid 84 cents to every dollar uh, paid to men. You know, when you like break down all the data, like mm -hmm. black women, it's like 67 cents to every dollar for of a non-Hispanic white man. A mom is 74%. 
74 cents to a dollar to a dad. Native wow. women is 57 to a non-Hispanic white man. And then Asian is like 92 cents for every dollar to a non-Hispanic white man, which I, which was funny. I was having a discussion with that one with my sisters because like, I was like, I don't, I think that this, cause this came from the the census, the most recent mm-hmm. census where this data came from. And, and I was sitting there I'm like, I, that, that was a really, the Asian American one was a little bit hard because like I was sitting there and I was like, I don't think I feel that, you know, for me mm-hmm. as, as being among first generation, um, immigrant to the u.s i was like i i I don't i don't see that for for myself because of the struggle that we had we went through you know Mm. like with my dad and um my dad was very educated in laos he was very smart but coming to the u.s you know that definitely changed for him like you know he wasn't working at a where he would be based off of who his education but he was so intelligent and so smart and educated but he was probably getting paid definitely on that lower half too with that and then this was back in the early 80s you know yeah i don't want to get this taken the wrong way but women still end up taking care of the children a little bit more well yeah i think like studies continue to show that women are are, have have a disproportionate amount of like household chores and duties um, in comparison to typically their, their, their male partners mm-hmm. um, that they're still, yeah, you're right. They're, they're going to work and then they're coming home and they're, they're taking care of the family um, mm-hmm. on top of making less at their job. Yep. But can we change that by making sure that like we were saying about like the job postings, like making sure that that is it's known what, what people will get paid for it so that there's no like going lower for somebody of whether it's based off of race or gender yeah yeah exactly uh so before we wrap up here uh one of the things that we love to do on this podcast is uh get in a time machine and and go back to a certain point in someone's life so for you i would like to go back to the point where you started working with your sister and creating art and doing the cross stitch with her if you could go back to talk to yourself back then, what would you tell yourself? What's the the advice that you would give yourself? Back in the days, um, pricing was a huge thing. Like it was like we were pricing our cross stitch, which is now like we priced at like sixty dollars. We were pricing it at twenty bucks. Ooh, yeah, all the work that you put in it because we we didn't know, you know, and yeah. we're just like, oh, we're just happy to get it out there in the world, you know, kind of type of thing. But like now that if I was to go back, I was like, okay, first of all, your your cross stitching back then was crap. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> you need to work on it better. <laughs> but it would have been like, you need to price more, you know, you need to make sure that you're 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 making what you you the time that you put into it. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. And then also the other advice that I would give myself is like, you're going to fight with your sister, but you guys will always be sisters. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, Juan, I, I appreciate your time today. This has been really great to, to talk with you, learn a little bit about you and obviously some of the great things you're doing at Springboard. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So my favorite thing to come out of this episode is their mantra and phrase my life is dope and i do dope shit love that i am living for that right now yes i just i had to go to their website right away and look at all of their stuff and there is so many brilliant funny great snarky as they say things on there and i recommend everybody go there go to their shop and buy all their stuff snarky cross stitching is probably now my favorite snarky art form it's fabulous and I need some of it in my house and in my life. I also really appreciated the conversation about pay equity. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. I spent a little bit of time like reading up on this because I was wondering, you know, specifically, like what can we do as, as individuals or as employees to help do this? Some of that is just being a bit more transparent on on salary information. I mean, sharing, you know, talking about salaries like with people who are in similar similar positions or within your same organization in similar positions. But one thing I thought was really interesting when I was looking at a list for employers, when you enter a position that hires people um, and sets those pay ranges, you should do a pay audit to see what everybody is making because as that is a great time to make sure that you are being equitable in those practices once you have that that power. 
The other thing is transparent salary policies. Um, for instance, you know, posting your salaries on job descriptions and making sure that people know those. But the one I thought was really interesting that I'd never actually heard of was to provide your employees with negotiation training, which is something I, I didn't even know existed. You know, where places to research salaries, how to negotiate fairly and how to, you know, sometimes you like check your own bias because you can get very emotional when you're talking about salary and talking about money and, you know, thinking about how that's going to affect everything outside of your job. Um, so how to, you know, sort of keep those, some of those emotions in line in that process, um, which I thought was really interesting. I, I never heard of that. Yeah, Kevin. And I love so much more that we're talking about these kind of pay equity conversations, whether you're talking about positions like we're in an organizations or artists. And she had mentioned the study that they were doing um, with UPenn about the like long-term impact of um, the guaranteed income. And I looked that up and it's connected with Stanford. They have a basic income lab. There is a part of the website where they're tracking like how many kinds of pilot studies like this one are happening. And you can see like how many participants are involved like across the country, what kind of expenses they're using. And like it just kind of gives you a real time look at the different things people are trying. You know, when you asked her, like, is this going to continue? Is this something that would be great? You know, I loved her answer of like, we'll see, you know. I think we all kind of see that there's something that could happen or that this could benefit. And I'm so glad to see that there's so many places where we're just getting information and trying to figure this out. Because like the first step is talking about it and like understanding what pay equity is. And so I just love any way that we can highlight this. And, you know, the work that she's doing is so incredible. Having that income is for for most people in those programs is mostly about survival, which I think is, you know, uh, both interesting and, and tragic, to be honest. Well, right, because we want artists to be able to have a long career and to be able to be in the industry for a long game. And like, in order to do that, you have to be able to have the financial stability of any other person and like the hope that you can build generational wealth and the hope that you can put savings into a rainy day fund and retirement. We need to find more ways to support artists so that they can live like people. If you want to dig more into the specific program that Springboard was doing, they have a really fantastic 14 page report on their website that maybe we can link in the show notes called The Art of Economic Justice, an impact report on the guaranteed income pilots for artists and creative workers in Minnesota that was published earlier in 2023. And it goes into a lot more depth and detail, including how they are using storytelling to change the narrative around universal basic income and the lives of artists and how the impact storytelling can have on public policy. So I thought that was a really fascinating part of this program and impact that it's having. So um, I would encourage everyone to go take a look at that report and read a little bit more in depth about the work that they're doing. From, you know, my perspective as somebody that's, you know, in a, in a very urban kind of setting is, you know, maybe bias. But, you know, I don't think of these kind of studies as happening in some place that's like not a huge urban center or, you know, even out in more rural communities. And with Springboard doing this, I mean, they're obviously in in a large metropolitan area, but like she's talking about expanding this out into rural communities. For anybody that kind of thinks a lot of these innovations kind of come out of cities and sometimes where the stories come from, but we don't ne necessarily always pay attention to the smaller places that exist in this country or, you know, more rural communities. I'm so glad that they're not ignoring the fact that like this might be different in a rural community, that we don't need to wait for huge organizations to do this. Like we can do this on a small scale on our own, funded by our own community. And like that's possible. The other part of the conversation you had, Kevin, was you dived a little into talking about gender and pay and the impact of unpaid labor um, on women, particularly in the workplace and their ability to earn a living wage and that sort of thing. So, and I am certainly not an expert in this area. I have my own personal experiences with this, um, but I just wanted to point everyone in the direction of a great resource online. Um, I follow this woman, Stephanie O'Connell Rodriguez on Instagram. She is a journalist and writer covering, covering ambition, money, and power, and is on 
she has her own website, has many, has been on many different news outlets, um, does great YouTube videos, but her handle on Instagram is Stephanie O'Connell. And she reports specifically on data and research around these issues. And I think the conversation starts with data. It starts with research to have a really deep understanding of how these issues impact people in their real lives. You've got to start with the numbers. If you want to learn more about this, it's imperative that you take the time to do some of the reading and the research and the learning yourself. Um, and then as we've talked about in the past on this podcast, talk to the people in your life that are experiencing those issues and get their perspective and get their real world experience. So then you may be able to make some changes within the organizations that you work into, like Kevin was talking about, and think about how those policies have real world impacts on the people around you. Katie, I couldn't agree more about to look at the data and the research, um, especially making sure that it's scientifically done. As Juan said in the interview, that she didn't feel it because the the number was higher than she expected. And oftentimes there's, you know, a lot of anecdotal or personal experience where it doesn't match up. We may have individual experiences that are outliers from the, the data. It's saying that the vast majority are according to the data. We need to make sure we're looking at the actual data that's done by uh, people that are doing it correctly and, and getting the research done properly. And that tells the story of the greater population. Again, there's always going to be outliers and examples that can, you know, have the opposite uh, effect, but it doesn't mean that it's not a problem. Well, friends, thank you for having this conversation with me. And I look forward to continuing this conversation on future episodes. And we look forward to seeing you back here on There's No Business Life. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Life. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Vanho. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? <laughs> I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslife.com. Do I sound out bus i -ness every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. I forgot who I was talking with, and they're like, wait, you know Josh Benson? I'm like, yeah, I'm on a podcast with <laughs> him. Like, oh, I, did you hear he got hit by a car? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could remember who that was. <laughs> That is hilarious. Yeah, that was really funny. I should have told you that when I forgot all about it. Oh, yeah, man. that's really funny. I, it's the most impressive thing is that it was in Toledo, and I think I saw three cars the entire <laughs> time we were there. <laughs> There's no I Toledo. Know. I know. I thought you were There's making no it traffic. up when you told us. Because yeah. like we'd been joking about the traffic. <laughs>